Hi everyone, and yes, here I have got another wonderful discussion for you today. And today I have Melissa. Hello, Melissa. Hello, how are you? <laughs> I'm good. Thank you for joining me. Good. Now, you and I had a bit of a discussion over email to talk about attachment styles and in particular, one particular attachment style. So before we talk about that, can you give people a little bit of where you are in the world and your background? For sure. So my name is Melissa Basie. I'm a registered psychologist in Calgary and I am moving into attachment-based coaching. So helping people manifest relationships with a healthy attachment style is the direction that I am headed in. So thank you so much for having me today. This is awesome that I get to talk about it. Oh, my pleasure. I think a lot of the people that watch this channel and also a lot of the people that I have contact with, whether it's via email or, or any other way, this is a, you're, you're going to be talking to the converted, let's say. Mm -hmm. They are already aware of this and identified themselves as this. And for those that don't know what it is, can you talk a little bit about what it is first? For sure. So attachment theory is basically the way that we attach to others. The way that it's assessed is at the beginning of life, depending on how we are connected with our primary caregivers, is how our attachment style is going to come to be. Now, later in life, we can develop an insecure attachment style, but oftentimes it's developed in childhood. But that's not to say it's always developed in childhood. So once we have our attachment style developed, we are going to fall into two categories, either the insecure attachment style or the secure attachment style. So about 50% of the population is secure, 50% is insecure. And then if we move over to the insecure category, within the insecure category, we have three different attachment styles. So the littlest one is called disorganized attachment, and that's only about 6% of the population within this category. And then the two main ones are avoidant attachment and anxious attachment. And avoidance and anxious usually pair up. And this is what we are seeing in the SP community is a whole lot of insecurely attached people, usually in the anxious category, looking for how they can manifest back their avoidant counterparts. So this yes. is, yeah. Yeah, that's so true. And I think manifesting an SP is so wonderful and possible. And if you can work on this particular theory, what we're talking about today, and improve that part of yourself, then I mean, relationships just go so much better, don't they? Oh, for sure. But it's so important for us to be able to heal our attachment style. Otherwise, we are going to be stuck in push-pull dynamics, uh, running, chasing. And this is where like the twin flame community comes in and they would really understand these dynamics as well. Mm. So it's all kind of related with attachment theory and how we are attaching to others. Yeah, yeah. What, okay, someone's watching this discussion now and they are saying to themselves, okay, I've already looked up a bit of that. I am one of those people that has that to deal with. What would be your suggestion of where they can start and how they can move into a healthier relationship by working on this part of themselves? Yeah, so the first thing to do, like you said, is really just acknowledging it and knowing exactly what the situation is. Then it would be helpful to begin recording triggers, what kind of life situations are making us feel like we want to act out, feel like we want to do various things in the relationship to try to manipulate the person to do what we want them to do. And so we're going to be wanting to pay attention in life to the things that are triggering us to do that. 
-hmm. Once we have that list of triggers, we're going to be wanting to go in and begin to understand what those triggers mean to us and what belief systems they are connected to so that we know which beliefs we're going to be needing to change in order to get a healthier relationship happening. Do you see in the work that you do with people, there are certain reoccurring beliefs that people hold? So I think probably abandonment issues, rejection issues, sometimes humiliation issues. There's various mm -hmm. types of things that people hold and they keep coming back up and they keep being triggered. And so that would be something that somebody is going to be wanting to be very clear on like, oh, that is one of my triggers. That mm -hmm. is something I have to be mindful of. And then once you have an understanding of what your triggers are, you can begin to work with yourself, work with your body, your mm -hmm. physical body in order to calm your nervous system and begin to integrate some of the things that you're learning into your actual behavior. Okay. Can you give me an example of a trigger and then the remedy and then Obviously, we never know exactly how long these things take because it takes different times, different amount of times for different people. Mm -hmm. But can you take us through that process? Sure. So some, a trigger might be that somebody's taking too long to text back. And so that would be then triggering our abandonment issues. Mm. So we begin to look at, okay, so-and-so is not texting me back. I'm feeling all of these feelings, especially mm. in my chest and my stomach. And it's feeling very overwhelming. And I want to mm. just text them and tell them, if you don't get back to me in this amount of time, I'm going to do this, give them ultimatums, do all of the kind of behaviors. So instead of doing all that, get really focused on what's going on inside your physical body. So that's going to be looking at things like the tightness in your chest, the knots in your stomach, bringing all of your conscious awareness out of your head and into your body to be present and available to the physical sensations that are coming up. This is how we move through triggers without having to act out. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that's great. So it's, it's bringing it back to us and rather than following through on that obsessive impulse, it's dealing with the self. Yeah. Is this something that if you practice in your experience that people can be free of this? Yes, absolutely. You, you can heal your attachment style. You can go from being insecurely attached to a securely attached person. So it's just going to take a lot of work, a lot of going, going home, coming home, going within and mm. really identifying what's going on inside, really bringing in those self-love components, those, those components mm. of showing up for ourselves when we're feeling uncomfortable that is going to be what pushes the needle forward to get you from secure attachment, sorry, from insecure attachment to secure attachment. Wonderful. Yeah. And I think that's going to be good news for a lot of people that get stuck in a loop and then they feel like, oh, you know, I can't get out of this. You know, my impulse to over contact, that's a big one. I'm glad you brought that one up because it is such a big one. They didn't text me in the amount of time that I think they should have texted me. And now I'm feeling, <gasps> you know, that, that overwhelming feeling. So that's going to be really good news for people to hear. And now we were saying about, okay, yes, this is a, a, a very common thing that a lot of the population experiences and it's understandable because parents go to work when kids are small it creates abandonment and then you know then there's the if a parent dies or whatever there's so many mm -hmm. things that can affect a person's feeling of security yeah so if you have this 
attachment style, if you are with a avoidant, mm -hmm. how does that affect that relationship? Because I know people are going to want to know the answer to that. Yeah. So if you're with an avoidant, you can expect to have many more triggers than what you would get if you were with a securely attached person. And so it's going to be an opportunity to really heal those triggers, to really pay attention, go inward and show up for yourself. So you can look at it as a highly triggering circumstance that you don't want to be in, or you can look at it as tons of opportunities to heal your own attachment style. Mm. Yes. And I think the more you work on this, the more you work on your self-love, the more you work on nurturing yourself, caring for yourself, knowing what your triggers are over the years, it just gets steadily better and better, easier and easier. And you start to, well, really you, it's not just head knowledge that you're looking for love on the outside. It becomes a experience in the body that you can learn to generate love for yourself so that you are no longer trying to attach to get love in that parent child dynamic. So mm, I think yeah. that's a powerful life lesson for many, many of us on the journey in relationships. And um, I mean, having a great relationship is not just for the one percent it is for well it's for those that are willing to look at themselves and to work on these parts and and you know I think when you know that you're not alone there's a whole section of the population that has to yeah 50 percent right yeah yeah I didn't realize it was that high Melissa yeah yeah I didn't know that so that's um a lot more than I thought it was so yeah, in a way that can give people comfort that it's, you know, not it's not just me, it's not just me. Yeah, exactly. Mm. And I think that the self-love, like you were saying, is just so, so, so important. And this is why I'm going from being a psychologist into attachment coaching, where I can bring some of the spirituality and the Neville Goddard and yes. the law of assumption into it. Because self-love is so so important not just so that you can regulate your nervous system not just so that you can heal your attachment style but everyone is you pushed out and so when you are loving yourself you are going to be drawing that love in towards you mm. because how you treat yourself is how other people are going to be treating you so it's not just the self benefits you get from self love, mm. but it's the benefits you get from other people that get called in. Not to mention, self love just feels good. It yes. just feels really, really good. And so, if you're looking for a way to regulate your nervous system, self love that is yeah. the that is the path. So agree with you. So agree with you. It is the foundational blocks of everything that we put on top of it whether it's the job you do your relationships with friends and friends and family or mm -hmm. uh romantic sexual relationships i think it it really just feels so much better being in your own skin when you are relaxed happy secure so yeah yeah, yeah. so important good that's great i'm i'm really glad that you decided that you contacted me to talk about this because oh, okay. I think this is a very uh, painful area for a lot of people, mm -hmm. but I, I know it is definitely something like you said, that you can break free of and get better at as the years go by and it will be reflected back to you. I mean, I'm so glad you love Neville because he was, the well it was the second book I read in the 90s and he has been oh, if I have a bible it's the law and the promise that's my bible from the 90s yeah 100 <laughs> percent yeah now you said uh, about law of assumption as well so how do you stitch together one second I gotta check the pizza yes <laughs> law of assumption and how it relates to the topic we've just been talking about 
do you find you use these two completely different things together to help people? Absolutely. So what I do is I take people through the process in the beginning of healing their attachment style and regulating their nervous system. These are two things that are absolutely crucial because regulating your nervous system is the equivalent of living in the end. It's the equivalent of being in the wish fulfilled. It's the wish fulfilled is a regulated nervous system and you get a regulated nervous system through self-love and through a bunch of different other things. But, uh, well, the bunch of other things would be a lot of the techniques that Neville teaches. So visualizing, affirming, SATs, these are all ways that we can regulate our nervous system. And it's that regulated nervous system that's going to bring your manifestation. Like that can't be underscored enough. A regulated nervous system will bring your manifestation. Mm, mm. Mm -hmm. Okay. The regulated nervous system can you take us through a little bit more of the mechanics of that process? Yeah, so we have what's called the vagus nerve. It runs from the base of our brain all the way down to the base of our spine and it hits everything, heart, liver, lung, stomach, it hits everything along the way. So this vagus nerve is responsible for regulating our nervous system and it can be activated in three different places. It can be activated up here, which is in a peaceful, calm place. It can be activated kind of mid chest and that's gonna be an anxious place. And it can be activated at the base of the spine, which is gonna be a down and depressed space. So like Abraham Hicks says, you're wanting to move up the emotional scale Mm -hmm. And it's the same with the nervous system. You're going to want to move up the ladder of the nervous system. You're going to want your vagus nerve to be activated up top. Okay. And so the way that you can regulate your nervous system, the way that you can work with your vagus nerve to get it into a calm, peaceful state is by doing techniques like Neville talks about, affirming, visualizing, using your imagination, all of these types of things are going to bring your nervous system into a calm, connected space. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's, um, you know, what you do, what you've been doing for work is an area that I haven't stepped into because I've been in the coaching world and in the manifesting world and in the, you know, studying Neville for 30 years world. So my approach has always been to come from that place but it's lovely to hear that part of it for me that's really interesting it's a knowledge base I don't have so I'm really glad you've you've shared it and made it simple and clear to understand so what would be the next thing you would do once you've done that part with someone that's got the anxious attachment what would you do with them after you work with the, I mean, the, the Neville staff applying it? And then would you get give them a bit of a weekly routine to practice or they would have to do that with you in a session or how does that work? Yeah, so I do that in sessions. And so once we get the healing part kind of squared away, we move into the manifesting part and then we see how the manifesting is going. If it's kind of bumpy, we probably haven't done the healing part well enough. So we have to mm -hmm. go back and, and do some more healing. But if manifestations are coming through pretty easily, we know we did our healing part pretty well. Yes. Yes. Yeah. That's so true. The results will tell you where you are really at because it yes. you out, as you said. So exactly. Mm. And do you weave in the law of assumption as well? Yeah. So another reason I'm moving into coaching as opposed to just um, seeing my psychology patients is because the law of assumption means that we are the God of our reality. And so I can't really talk like that in my sessions. If I do no. talk like that in my sessions, I do get my patients to sign a consent form saying that they understand that we're doing spiritual based principles as opposed to evidence based principles. So I cover my butt. <laughs> yes. Yes. But 
I would prefer to just be able to work with people who I can say like, you are the God of your reality. What does that mean? That means that nobody else has free will in your reality. And you get to go forward and use your consciousness to create whatever it is that you want to have in your reality. You don't have to if you don't want to, but you're still going to be creating. Like you can say, no, I don't want to be the God of my reality. That doesn't matter. You still are the God of your reality. And so creation is going to happen whether you're conscious of it or, or unconscious of it. So you might as well just get conscious about it. That's my stance on law of assumption. <laughs> okay, this, this whole there is no free will versus there is free will is a massive atomic bomb in the manifesting circles, as you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I, today, I believe people do have free will. And, mm -hmm. but I understand what you're saying. You know, I do understand what you're saying and where you're coming from. Well, okay, this is why I'm, I wanted to bring this up because people that are manifesting a specific person, yep. they bring this free will versus no free will up on a regular basis. Now, if someone is trying to manifest the SP or even trying to manifest a brand new relationship, and it's not happening for them in terms of if they believe that particular person that there is no free will why would you say it's not manifesting for them they haven't done some healing work there's still something about the way they're seeing themselves that is being reflected in their sp now it could be from old belief systems that are coming up to clear. Yeah. But if, but you can tell that, right? If you've been working with somebody and things have already come up to clear and things mm. have been smooth sailing, if something else comes up to clear, that's probably something else coming up to clear. But if you, if they hit a consistently bumpy patch, it's because they're coming up against a trigger that needs yeah. to be worked through. What would you say? In terms of if an SP is not coming towards you, yeah, I, I agree with what you said. I think there's usually a lot more healing to do. Yeah, I do think that, well, I, I have to agree with people can reject what you send. So, and, and I'm, I'll tell you why. There was a guy that wanted to manifest me he was so fixated and I liked him. He was a nice person, but I didn't want to be with him. Now, he, man he focused on me so much, he manifested me sitting next to him in a stadium of 100,000 people at a Jason Derulo concert. Now, I didn't particularly want to be sitting next to him because I wasn't interested in him in that way. So his power to manifest me next to him was really good. Mm -hmm. But I still had the choice to say yes or no, to accept or reject. So he, if we look at it, did he need to do more healing? Maybe yes, maybe no. It doesn't matter how much healing he would have done. I was going to be a no. So this is why I question the there is no free will because Technically, that should have worked for him. But for this experience, for this particular relationship, I was on, I was the SP. I was his SP. And he made it clear to me that he was going to move in with me and do all sorts of things. And I was mortified. I felt suffocated and wanted to get away from him. Now, if that had been someone I wanted to be with, it would have been an amazing experience. But I think... And the reason I want to bring this up, Melissa, is because I do see there is a lot of people wanting to control and that's why they don't want someone with free will. And that I see again and again and again. And that's a bit disturbing for me because love isn't about control. It's about freedom and someone coming to you because they want to be there. I mean, my person that I'm with now, who is my SP, who started off 
saying to me years ago, you're not for me, you're not for me. We've had a wonderful relationship for over 10 years now. Mm. But I know he lays in bed next to me because he wants to be there. It's not okay. because I did do some, obviously, healing and all of those things, that, you know, all those years ago. But I can tell you I'm, I was glad that I didn't go into I'm going to use LOA, Neville, to make this happen. Mm. That's where I see there's a crossing of wires between there's no free will and people wanting to use it to control. And that's a red flag for me. I think if people are wanting to use it to control, I would go into self-love. Like what is going on that you are needing another person so badly to do what you want them to do in order to feel what you want to feel. You should yes. feel that without another person. That's mm -hmm. And you feel that by having a regulated nervous system. However, yes. with your situation, I would question what may, because I don't, in my reality, it's just me and my clients when I'm working with clients, right? Yeah. My reality is my reality. Their reality is their reality. There's no one to say that they even intersect. Really? I'm just creating my clients. That, that's my belief. So what I would say about your situation is, what was it that prompted you to create a man who was so obsessed with you that you weren't into? I would put that back on you and say, you were the creator of that situation. What's going on in your vibration that had you, had you bring a person like this into your life? Mm. Yeah, you had no desire to be with him. So it was no. never going to happen. Only your reality is the one at play. So that's what I'm always training yeah. my clients about. Like my reality is my, the only reality at play, but their reality is the only reality at play. And we have no evidence to say that we have overlapping realities with anyone. <laughs> this is just the thought. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it is food for thought. I mean, when I look back at that time, I had um, I had played the part of being the abandoned one that was chasing love. So this was a weird one because it came at the total opposite end of the spectrum. Um, and yes, definitely, I I agree with you. I think it is everyone's us pushed out. So it was about not having clear boundaries. And there must have been at the, on some level not having good self-love to set boundaries, to say no, and to not attract it in the first place. So it is, it is about self-reflection. I agree. I think it's a big topic, this free will versus yeah. no free will. <laughs> it really is. It's massive. And there's so many different ways to look at it. And, mm -hmm. you know, each to their own. I think it's, you know, I mean, Neville... <laughs> There's been many debates about what Neville really thinks about this because if you read one yes. book and then you read books years later, yes. you know, he actually talks about in prayer the art of believing people yes. can reject what you send. And yes. he talks about thought he transmission. Does. So, you know, and I don't say that to freak people out, but I'm also going to, you know, if I'm going to talk about Neville and having studied, studied him for 30 years, I'm not just yeah. going to tell you the bits that you want to hear. That's not yeah. my job. You know, Neville is Neville. You can totally disagree with what he says. You can apply some stuff and take what you want and leave the rest. It's totally up to people what they do. Yeah. So, but it is a, it, it is a big atomic bomb topic in this whole community about what Neville said and what he said as he was, because he was evolving himself as he wrote yes. book one to book number 10, you know, there was an evolution within his own self about what he thought, what he'd experienced and his maturing as a man. So that was reflected in, in his books and in his teachings. Yeah. Just happens for us. Same again. It's, it's true. And I remember asking a manifesting coach about that because I had read both of Neville's 
you know, on one hand, he says you can reject what other people are sending you. But on the other hand, he says that you are the sole creator in your reality. And so, and I never really got a clear answer except for just that he's evolving too and he's human too, which is totally yeah. fine. Yeah. I yeah. think I just choose to perf- like choose to go with we are the god of our reality um i I, you know i can't even tell you why it just it just maybe it's power i think it is a little bit of power in that um it makes me feel like i am the sole determinant of how my life goes and i i really like that idea so i but i think it can go either way like you're saying absolutely yeah it's a it's a fascinating topic and it's also interesting to hear how other people interpret it, you know, yeah. and not only interpret it from what you read, but interpret it from how you move through the world and what gets reflected back to you. I mean, I find my clients are being pushed out. So why is it that this month I've got yeah. 10 people asking me the same things? I'm not helping you. I'm dissolving the part of me that still got something going on about that topic. So I don't say that to clients, but that's what I do. When something comes again and again with, you know, half a dozen people, you go, that's something for me to work on more deeply myself. I'm not fixing, helping, healing you. I'm, that's not what I'm doing. Yeah. I am continually, I've put myself into the frying pan to heal myself by working with you. That's the work. Mm. Yes, 100%. That's so awesome. I love that thought of how even our clients are really just something that we are, that's something that's coming up to clear for us. Yes. That's amazing. I love that. That's great. Yeah, it takes the, um, the pedestal away if someone's given it to you yeah yeah which is good which is good we're all students on the path (laughs) yes I love it (laughs) well do you want to is there anything else you wanted to bring up was this something else that you thought oh I want to mention this or anything else Uh, I think I said it really with the self-love. The self-love is just so, so key. Everyone is you pushed out. And so if you're ever looking for a reason to do self-love because you're just really down on yourself, Mm. if for no other reason, do it because you will then bring more people into your life that love you the way you want to be loved. There's there's endless reasons to do self-love. But I think when we're down on ourselves, we forget why we're supposed to do self-love. And I don't love, I don't think that it's awesome to just do it so that other people like us. Yes. But if that's the only reason you can get yourself to do it, then use that reason. To start. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So important. So incredibly important. Let me ask you actually. Because I talk a lot about self-love and doing certain things. What would you say are three to five really good self-love practices for people? Mm, So rampages of appreciation. So that's an Abraham Hicks term. So just rampaging about why you love yourself so much. What is so lovable about you? Uh, writing that down, having that for later, recording it into a voice recorder, having it as a meditation for yourself, listening to it before you go to sleep as like a SATS technique. Yes. Um, There's just so many different ways that you can begin to incorporate self-love. I would say a practice at the end of the day, looking at five things that you are proud of yourself for. Mm-hmm. Because if you do that enough days in a row, maybe the first couple of days won't be the biggest deal. But if you do that enough days in a row, you're start going to start training yourself to find where you're going to be proud of yourself because you know you have to write it down at the end of the day. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. That's so those true. would be a few that I would start okay. with. I would want to probably inundate people with like just yeah. a ton of self-love techniques. But those would be a few is really tune in affirm write it down 
record it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just a few. Yeah. No, that's good. How that's about good. you? What would you say are three to five really good self-love? I, I hear consistently I'm exhausted. So my self-love tip, go to bed. <laughs> just go to bed. Yeah. Get more sleep. You cannot do techniques. You cannot do affirmations if your head is fogged out from being tired. Yeah. And it, it's like everyone's running around exhausted. I hear that word so often from people and I think well I understand sometimes you you've got a low paying job and you're working a lot of hours I get it you know but when you get a day off have an afternoon sleep when you can sleep in the next day or go to bed a bit earlier you got to look at your patterns because I know a lot of people stay up late because they don't want to go to work the next day because they want some time to themselves because they want that bit of freedom but then you end up shooting yourself in the foot so it's like, that would be my number one. Yeah. Number two, I would say have some kind of prayer and meditation practice. Mm -hmm. You don't have to believe in God. You don't have to believe in anything outside of yourself. If you want to just sit in nature and enjoy the presence of nature, that is enough. But I think that regular contact whether you do it on a walk, whether you do it um, sitting under a tree in, a, in the park and you take some time to do some breathing, I think breathing is a great way to bring yourself into the present and say to yourself, how do I feel right now? And as you do that, then you go, okay, well, I'm feeling like a two out of 10. Why? Mm -hmm. Because I haven't had anything to drink. I haven't had any water for the last eight hours and I'm getting a headache and I'm dehydrated so it's making sure you keep on top of yourself with what the physical body needs so yes. then once the physical body gets what it needs then your mind is clearer to do rampages affirmations meditation yes. visualization sats or whatever it is so yes I think you gotta the body we are part of nature the body needs certain things to function so deal with that first as best you can then the mental diet, and then if you do those two things, the feeling and emotion in your body will be better, and then from that, you will just be more comfortable as you move around your day. And and I think, too, a self-love thing, just have more fun, like music, swimming, um, bike riding, do stuff that, that has nothing to do with what you call self-love but that just gives you that lift and makes you feel free and happy and good if you do that whew, your your whole vibration lifts and then all that stuff you were worried about it starts to dismantle itself because you haven't been watering the plant of dissatisfaction yeah you've been living the the feeling and that rush of fun and joy and then that energy, that vibration goes into relationships, money, work, all these other situations, because the joy of you has been ignited. Yes, I love that. That's so awesome. I love how you bring it down to the very basics first of just mm. like actually the first step. You're right in that, that those are really first steps to moving into self-love. I think that some of the things that I recommended, like you said, are next steps. Yeah. 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 Well, hopefully yeah. between the two of us, they've got yeah. two, halves, two halves of the nuts. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, well, wonderful. Now, for those of you that are watching that made it to the end of the video down below, I'm going to put all the bits and pieces so you can contact Melissa, see what she does and just be able to see what she's doing that's you know help giving people a bit of relief and for those of you that love the law of assumption and neville and you can see it's combined with what she studied and practices and she's bringing those two things together then melissa's details will be down below for you so you can contact her directly so melissa thank you so much thank is you there for having me while I think of it, can you say, are you on social media? Are you have a website? How can people find you? What, what means? Yeah. So you can go to attachmentrecovery.com. 
Yeah. And you will find a guide that I have there that talks about attachment trauma. So that's going to be helpful for you. And you can also find me on YouTube and Instagram. Excellent. Okay. Yeah. And I will have the links down below for people to click on directly. Perfect. So thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Do you want to say a few final words before we go? I think we, you know, I think we pretty much summed it up. Self-love is my big thing. I think I said it. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. My pleasure. And um, thank you for bringing up some things I hadn't thought about or things I learned a little bit today too. So that was okay. really good. It's always nice to keep broadening the the well whatever we're learning because we all come from different backgrounds and we've all learned different things so I always love that part of it yeah so thank you and everyone thank you for joining us and as always I will see you in the next YouTube